Anne of the Island by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter Ten, Patty's Place. The next evening found them treading resolutely the herringbone walk through the tiny garden. The April wind was filling the pine trees with its roundelay, and the grove was alive with robins, great plump saucy fellows, strutting along the paths. The girls rang rather timidly and were admitted by a grim and ancient handmaiden. The door opened directly into a large living room, where by a cheery little fire sat two other ladies, both of whom were also grim and ancient. Except that one looked to be about seventy and the other fifty, there seemed little difference between them. Each had amazingly big, light blue eyes behind steel-rimmed spectacles. Each wore a cap and a gray shawl. Each was knitting without haste and without rest. Each rocked placidly and looked at the girls without speaking, and just behind each sat a large white china dog with round green spots all over it, a green nose and green ears. Those dogs captured Anne's fancy on the spot. They seemed like the twin guardian deities of Patty's place. For a few moments nobody spoke. The girls were too nervous to find words, and neither the ancient ladies nor the china dogs seemed conversationally inclined. Anne glanced about the room. What a dear place it was! Another door opened out of it directly into the pine grove, and the robins came boldly up on the very step. The floor was spotted with round braided mats, such as Marilla made at Green Gables, but which were considered out of date everywhere else, even in Avonlea. And yet here they were on Spofford Avenue. A big, polished grandfather's clock ticked loudly and solemnly in a corner. There were delightful little cupboards over the mantelpiece, behind whose glass doors gleamed quaint bits of china. The walls were hung with old prints and silhouettes. In one corner the stairs went up, and at the first low turn was a long window with an inviting seat. It was all just as Anne had known it must be. By this time the silence had grown too dreadful, and Priscilla nudged Anne to intimate that she must speak. We. We saw by your sign that this house is to let," said Anne faintly, addressing the older lady, who was evidently Miss Patty Spofford. "'Oh, yes,' said Miss Patty. "'I intended to take that sign down to-day. Then, then we are too late,' said Anne sorrowfully. "'You've let it to someone else?' "'No, but we have decided not to let it at all.' "'Oh, I'm so sorry,' exclaimed Anne impulsively. "'I love this place so. I did hope we could have got it.' Then did Miss Patty lay down her knitting take off her specs, rub them, put them on again, and for the first time look at Anne as at a human being. The other lady followed her example so perfectly that she might as well have been a reflection in a mirror. "'You love it,' said Miss Patty with emphasis. "'Does that mean that you really love it, or that you merely like the looks of it? The girls nowadays indulge in such exaggerated statements that one never can tell what they do mean. It wasn't so in my young days. Then a girl did not say she loved turnips in just the same tone as she might have said she loved her mother or her savior. Anne's conscience bore her up. I really do love it, she said gently. I've loved it ever since I saw it last fall. My two college chums and I want to keep house next year instead of boarding, so we're looking for a little place to rent, and when I saw that this house was to let I was so happy. If you love it you can have it, said Miss Patty. Maria and I decided today that we would not let it after all, because we did not like any of the people who have wanted it. We don't have to let it. We can afford to go to Europe even if we don't let it. It would help us out, but not for gold will I let my home pass into the possession of such people as have come here and looked at it. You are different. I believe you do love it and will be good to it. You can have it. If—if if we can afford to pay what you ask for it, hesitated Anne. Miss Patty named the amount required. Anne and Priscilla looked at each other. Priscilla shook her head. "'I'm afraid we can't afford quite so much,' said Anne, choking back her disappointment. "'You see, we are only college girls, and we are poor.' "'What were you thinking you could afford?' demanded Miss Patty, ceasing not to knit. Anne named her amount. Miss Patty nodded gravely. "'That will do. As I told you, it is not strictly necessary that we should let it at all. We are not rich, but we have enough to go to Europe on. I have never been in Europe in my life, and never expected or wanted to go. But my niece there, Maria Spofford, has taken a fancy to go. Now you know a young person like Maria can't go globe-trotting alone." "'No, I, I suppose not,' murmured Anne, seeing that Miss Patty was quite solemnly in earnest. "'Of course not. So I have to go along to look after her. I expect to enjoy it, too. I am seventy years old, but I am not tired of living yet. I dare say I'd have gone to Europe before if the idea had occurred to me. We shall be away for two years, perhaps three. We sail in June, and we shall send you the key, and leave all in order for you to take possession when you choose. We shall pack away a few things we prize especially, but all the rest will be left." 
"'Will you leave the china dogs?' asked Anne timidly. "'Would you like me to?' "'Oh, indeed, yes. They're delightful.' A pleased expression came into Miss Patty's face. "'I think a great deal of those dogs,' she said proudly. "'They are over a hundred years old, and have sat on either side of this fireplace ever since my brother Aaron brought them from London fifty years ago. Spofford Avenue was called after my brother Aaron.' "'A fine man he was,' said Miss Maria, speaking for the first time. "'Ah, you don't see the like of him nowadays.' "'He was a good uncle to you, Maria,' said Miss Patty, with evident emotion. "'You do well to remember him.' "'I shall always remember him,' said Miss Maria solemnly. "'I can see him, this minute, standing there before that fire, with his hands under his coat-tails, beaming on us.' Miss Maria took out her handkerchief and wiped her eyes, but Miss Patty came resolutely back from the regions of sentiment to those of business. "'I shall leave the dogs where they are, if you will promise to be very careful of them,' she said. "'Their names are Gog and Magog. Gog looks to the right, and Magog to the left. And there's just one thing more. You don't object, I hope, to this house being called Patty's Place?' "'No, indeed. We think that is one of the nicest things about it.' "'You have sense, I see,' said Miss Patty, in a tone of great satisfaction. "'Would you believe it? All the people who came here to rent the house wanted to know if they couldn't take the name off the gate during their occupation of it.' I told them roundly that the name went with the house. This has been Patty's place ever since my brother Aaron left it to me in his will, and Patty's place it shall remain until I die and Maria dies. After that happens, the next possessor can call it any fool name he likes," concluded Miss Patty, much as she might have said, after that, the deluge. And now, wouldn't you like to go over the house and see it all before we consider the bargain made? Further exploration still further delighted the girls. Besides the big living-room there was a kitchen and a small bedroom downstairs. Upstairs were three rooms, one large and two small. Anne took an especial fancy to one of the small ones, looking out into the big pines, and hoped it would be hers. It was papered in pale blue, and had a little old-timey toilet-table, with sconces for candles. There was a diamond-paned window with a seat under the blue muslin frills that would be a satisfying spot for studying or dreaming. "'It's all so delicious that I know we are going to wake up and find it a fleeting vision of the night,' said Priscilla, as they went away. "'Miss Patty and Miss Maria are hardly such stuff as dreams are made of,' laughed Anne. "'Can you fancy them globe-trotting, especially in those shawls and caps?' "'I suppose they'll take them up when they really begin to trot,' said Priscilla. "'But I know they'll take their knitting with them everywhere. They simply couldn't be parted from it. They will walk about Westminster Abbey and knit, I feel sure.' Meanwhile, Anne, we shall be living in Patty's place, and on Spofford Avenue. I feel like a millionairess even now." "'I feel like one of the morning stars that sang for joy,' said Anne. Phil Gordon crept into thirty-eight St. John's that night and flung herself on Anne's bed. "'Girls, dear, I'm tired to death. I feel like the man without a country. Or was it without a shadow? I forget which. Anyway, I've been packing up. "'And I suppose you are worn out because you couldn't decide which things to pack first or where to put them?' laughed Priscilla. "'Exactly. And when I had got everything jammed in somehow, and my landlady and her maid had both sat on it while I locked it, I discovered I had packed a whole lot of things I wanted for convocation at the very bottom. I had to unlock the old thing and poke and dive into it for an hour before I fished out what I wanted. I would get hold of something that felt like what I was looking for, and I'd yank it up, and it would be something else.' No, Anne, I did not swear. I didn't say you did. Well, you looked it. But I admit my thoughts verged on the profane. And I have such a cold in the head, I can do nothing but sniffle, sigh, and sneeze. Isn't that alliterative agony for you? Queen Anne, do say something to cheer me up. Remember that next Thursday night you'll be back in the land of Alec and Alonso, suggested Anne. Phil shook her head dolefully. More alliteration. No, I don't want Alec and Alonso when I have a cold in the head. But what has happened to you two? Now that I look at you closely, you seem all lighted up with an internal iridescence. Why, you're actually shining! What's up?" "'We are going to live in Patty's place next winter,' said Anne triumphantly. "'Live, mark you, not board. We've rented it, and Stella Maynard is coming, and her aunt is going to keep house for us.' Phil bounced up, wiped her nose, and fell on her knees before Anne. "'Girls, girls, let me come, too. Oh, I'll be so good. If there's no room for me, I'll sleep in the little doghouse in the orchard. I've seen it. Only let me come. Get up, you goose. I won't stir off my marrow-bones till you tell me I can live with you next winter.' Anne and Priscilla looked at each other. Then Anne said slowly, "'Phil, dear, we'd love to have you. But we may as well speak plainly. I'm poor. Pris is poor. Stella Maynard is poor. Our housekeeping will have to be very simple and our table plain.' You'd have to live as we would. 
Now you are rich, and your boarding-house fare attests the fact." "'Oh, what do I care for that?' demanded Phil, tragically. "'Better a dinner of herbs where your chums are than a stalled ox in a lonely boarding-house. Don't think I'm all stomach, girls. I'll be willing to live on bread and water with just a little jam, if you'll let me come." "'And then,' continued Anne, "'there will be a good deal of work to be done. Stella's aunt can't do it all. We all expect to have our chores to do. Now you—' "'Toil not, neither do I spin,' finished Philippa. "'But I'll learn to do things. You'll only have to show me once. I can make my own bed to begin with. And remember that, though I can't cook, I can keep my temper. That's something. And I never growl about the weather. That's more. Oh, please, please! I never wanted anything so much in my life. And this floor is awfully hard." "'There's just one more thing,' said Priscilla resolutely. You, Phil, as all Redmond knows, entertain callers almost every evening. Now at Patty's place we can't do that. We have decided that we shall be at home to our friends on Friday evenings only. If you come with us, you'll have to abide by that rule." "'Well, you don't think I'll mind that, do you? Why, I'm glad of it. I knew I should have had some such rule myself, but I hadn't enough decision to make it or stick to it. When I can shuffle off the responsibility on you, it will be a real relief. If you won't let me cast in my lot with you, I'll die of the disappointment, and then I'll come back and haunt you. I'll camp on the very doorstep of Patty's place, and you won't be able to go out or come in without falling over my spook." Again Anne and Priscilla exchanged eloquent looks. Well said Anne. Of course, we can't promise to take you until we've consulted with Stella. But I don't think she'll object. And as far as we are concerned, you may come and glad welcome." "'If you get tired of our simple life, you can leave us, and no questions asked,' added Priscilla. Phil sprang up, hugged them both jubilantly, and went on her way, rejoicing. "'I hope things will go all right,' said Priscilla, soberly. "'We must make them go right,' avowed Anne. "'I think Phil will fit into our happy little home very well. Oh, Phil's a dear to rattle around with and be chums. And, of course, the more there are of us, the easier it will be on our slim purses. But how will she be to live with? You have to summer and winter with anyone before you know if she's livable or not. Oh, well, we'll all be put to the test as far as that goes. And we must quit us like sensible folk, living and let live. Phil isn't selfish, though she's a little thoughtless, and I believe we will all get on beautifully in Patty's place. End of chapter 10